Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news report today, Wednesday, October 31st, 2012. All the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description, so please go check those out. All right, so we're talking about Turkey right now and how the southern buildup may be aimed at the Kurds and not the Syrian government. Uh, also, uh, Erdogan in Turkey is banning opposition protests. Really, it's just a rally and celebration. Uh, also, you have uh, Kurdish hunger strikes going on, and uh, you have Kurdish protesters. They actually had a firebombs and water cannons. So, protesters clashing with the Turkish police over these uh, prisoners who have been going on for six to eight weeks with a hunger strike. Rebel Kurd tensions boil over in the north and create friction. So, it goes on here. It says that uh, this Hafar was killed at dawn, shot while reportedly trying to rescue his brother, mortally wounded from the latest gun battles between Sunni Arab rebels and Kurdish militia in Syria. It was the second clash in 48 hours and killed up to four Arabs near the Kurdish village of Yazdiba, close to the Turkish border in northern Syria. It says angry, upset men and fighters dressed in fatigues, touting uh, Kalishkinikovs, gathered outside his house to pay their respects. So a few few wanted to talk to a Western reporter. So they were yelling, Ali Akbar, and God is greatest, uh, Gaya, God is greatest, and um, they were talking about the rebels here, fighting against the regime of Bashar al-Assad. They're taking part of the inver uh, invasion and regime change that's uh, being pushed by the West. The enemy is now the PKK, Kurdish militia, because they are sod dogs, he mutters, slumped in a plastic chair, waiting for a funeral procession to begin. When they kill us, we'll kill them. Said, we will punish them. I can't say now, but in the coming days, you'll see. But on Monday, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said a Kurd uh, tortured by rebels died after being captured near the northern village. There are reports right now of the Free Syrian terrorists uh, sending reinforcements to the checkpoint where Hafar was killed. It says in areas where rebels have forced the regime out, there is a security vacuum, vacuum where uh, some of the fighters don't want democracy at all. They're just warlords who are taking advantage of the chaos. Well, I don't think any of them want democracy, right? So there's a abductor of Lebanese pilgrims in Syria killed by Kurdish rebels. So it says here, Abu Abrahim, the abductor of a group of Lebanese pilgrims in Syria, has been killed during an attempt to storm a town in Aleppo's countryside. According to the TV station, Kurdish popular committees uh, killed Ibrahim and four members of the group as they were trying to storm the town. Olympo's countryside. So yeah, actually they abducted another uh, Lebanese journalist on Saturday, so go figure that. And uh, yeah, under house arrest, blah, 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 blah. So just like the one video that I showed uh, where they were actually meeting Turkish army generals. So the, the, the Free Syrian rebel army terrorists are actually abducting uh, journalists from Lebanon and handing them over to Turkey. So... Uh, Syrian rebels in ceasefire talks with Kurdish militia. Re rebel held Kurdish captive dies of torture. So that's what we were covering. This individual, Hamdu, uh, was actually killed. He died from wounds caused by torture while in custody of the rebels. Then we have Lebanon. Lebanon assassination forces EU and U.S. to reconsider its policy. As forces from the Lebanese uh, got sidetracked from accusing the Syrian regime of assassinating um, the Brigadier General, by attacking the government headquarters in Beirut, the U.S. officials did not lose focus on the assassination of the head of Internal Security Information Branch. goes on and says, Hassan is not a passing figure for the Americans. He has headed Lebanese U.S. security cooperation since 2006, maintained communications with the CIA over all aspects of Lebanese crisis. So, uh, despite the wave of arrest of pro-Israel spy networks on Lebanese territory, but it goes on here, and it says that uh, that Hariri and the ISF director represents a red line for the U.S. Beyond the ongoing political debate, Washington views the assassination as a blow against it as well. Thus, it is today in the phase of reconsidering its policy towards Lebanon despite the limited options available to it. So far, the U.S. is trying to carefully approach the issue of the government, and right now they're looking to President Michael Suleiman to form such a government, a neutral government, there has been praise of Salman's recent positions, especially during Hassan's funeral. And finishing up the dilemma of Lebanese leaders in dealing with the U.S. position may be that they want to hear clear words about what Washington wants, their intentions, right? You know, tell the truth. But it says, well, the U.S. approach will remain ambiguous. 
not only because of the presidential election is drawing near, therefore the Lebanese file will probably not make it to President Barack Obama's desk because Washington cannot have a strategy in Lebanon as long as it doesn't have a strategy in Syria. So you can go in there and check that out. Uh, it's a pretty long article, but pretty informative about what's going on. Gulf Union plans emerge as Middle East braces to meet challenges. I've covered this before, and this is about Bahrain, because this came out just a day or two after I covered it. The U.S.-backed regime in Bahrain bans all protests. Obama continues to support the brutal Bahraini dictatorship, valuing ruthless control of the Persian Gulf over democracy. Remember this article, and uh, it was talking about what? About this um, basically two-day conference, Arab Identity and Security of the Gulf. They're talking about correlating the security threats and dangers facing the Gulf region within the uh, challenges facing Arabism and the Gulf. I believe they were just talking about Sunnism and stuff like that. Um, but it goes on here and it says that the main concern of the conference was to identify the source of security threats against Bahrain, in particular in the Gulf states. The, so the results of the so-called Arab Spring, the popular Arab movement that took place and still taking place, were also topics of interest, especially amid continued domestic tension in Bahrain between the opposition and the government. So this has visuals of what should be. So some of the uh, goals that were proposed, Gulf state government should focus on three issues, implementing serious political reform, achieving social justice, and establishing a Gulf union. So I don't know, you know, it's like, do, is this what they're trying to do? Is this their idea of it then? Do I banning the all protests? But remember, they're about uh, creating, what, a regional Gulf order, or a Gulf Union. And this is, of course, to oppose Iran and Iraq, which are mostly Shia-dominated countries. So next up, Kuwait. Kuwait arrests opposition leader ahead of mass protests. Kuwaiti authorities arrest a prominent opposition figure over his criticism of the Gulf Arab state's ruler. The leader of the Nationalist Popular Action Bloc. Then to Libya. Libya has no control on Bani Wali, says defense minister. So the government's saying that they have absolutely no control over the militias or the country. Libyan militias are keeping refugees from returning home to Bani Wali. Almost all the population fled, 70 to 90,000 people. Remember I showed the video of it. it. says, but troops with the Misrata militia aren't letting that happen. They're talking about getting out of the desert and getting food and water and shelter and it says they uh they have announced that they don't intend to let anyone return to their homes for at least the next several days libya army insists it has no control over the attack and it was entirely up to the militia however i don't believe that protesters storm libya congress after prime minister presents government so protesters storm libya's national assembly on tuesday forcing the cancellation of the vote on the proposed coalition government named by the country's new prime minister just hours earlier. Remember, I covered this about a month ago where they had presented this and it was turned down uh, by the whatever National Congress. And then an article, article came out the next day, the very next day, saying that the Western Western leaders and, you know, NATO and them in the U.S., they didn't like, uh, they didn't like what the, basically what they had drawn up. So the lineup. So then they went back to the drawing board and did it again. Basically, because it was uh, it was not having enough Western um, influence or representation in the government, Taliban hit region seen as safest for Afghans. Can you believe that? Then we have Taliban leaders can run for Afghan president. So um, you remember the U.S. wanting to sit down with talks or for talks with the Taliban. Uh, we know that they helped uh, create them back in the what the 80s, 70s, something like that. The U.S. did and CIA against the Soviet Union. And um, the other thing, too, was what? Was that the U.S. is paying the Taliban to not attack its convoys. That's why you always see NATO convoys set ablaze and attack, because the U.S. is paying them not to attack it. Okay, so preliminary trial for Robert Bales will consider whether he had acted alone. Do you guys remember this? The American soldier accused of murdering 16 Afghans, mostly women and children, uh, back in March will appear in a hearing early next month the issue of the court will deal with the version of the story knocked around since the crime was committed. Bales did not act alone. So there are witness statements that there was more than one shooter. And you could say, well, why would they do this? Well, if they want to stay there longer and have a longer presence, they, by doing something like this, this would uh, 
make the Afghan people rally around insurgents or Taliban who then carry out attacks like they're doing every day, uh, wearing police uniforms and killing uh, U.S. soldiers. Um, they're dressed as policemen. And so then, you know, that's what happens. And then it creates more crisis, and then the U.S. can maintain its presence there. It's sick, but I think that's how it works. Supporters of ex-Ivory Coast President Bagbo hold demo at The Hague. Supporters of the former Ivory Coast President Bagbo have gathered in front of the court building in the Netherlands where his procedural pretrial hearing is taking place. In Somalia, Somalia general, four others killed in ambush. Officials blame Al-Shabaab for the attack. A town in southern Somalia which has been mostly conquered by Kenyan troops in the re recent invasion, Mirka, which is down here and more in the south, uh, has recently fallen back under Al-Shabaab's control to the extent that any Somali cities can be said to be under control of any faction. There's also this article from the 24th, Somali rebels bolster northern Tora Bora base while the extremist movement is badly damaged, a hardcore remain a potent threat, linking up with regional rebel groups and leaving operatives to launch attacks across the south. So, so yeah, actually, they're doing the same thing as the Taliban fighters that went to Tora Bora to, like I said, lick their wounds. I haven't mentioned this recently um, in the reports. It said they're pulling back to their own mountain bases in northern uh, Golgala region. So they're taking on 17,000 strong African Union force, force as well as Ethiopian troops and Somali forces. Remember, I was talking about how they were going through these back roads and the AU forces and Kenyan forces were, it was actually like uh, wreaking havoc on their nerves because they're driving down these roads in the country and they're constantly uh, under attack or possibility of attack. But I don't know. Maybe they should just leave them alone, I guess, and let them determine their own fate. It says here, 17th killed. Somali journalist dies of wounds. So a radio station editor in Somalia says a journalist who was attacked by gunmen last week died of his wounds, bringing the number of journalists killed and targeted attacks in Somalia this year to 17. Then Israel. Israeli uh, says Iran has pulled back from nuclear bomb goal. However, Israeli readers or leaders want to spin it. The fact is, is that even now... They admit that an imminent threat of nuclear-armed Iran is non-existent. So the Defense Minister, Barak, has admitted that Iran pulled back on its nuclear ambitions by allocating its medium-enriched uranium for civilian purposes earlier this year, but insisted on keeping the threat of military action on the table. So some double, double speak, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with here in the United States. We get plenty of it. Netanyahu, a war on Iran would be good for Arabs, so war on Iran would destabilize the region, harming the interests of Arab regimes and worsening the lot of Arab populations. He said it would uh, benefit their interests and that a feeling of relief would spread across the region immediately following an attack. The experts generally agree that such an attack would spark a regional war and embolden Iran and in fact motivate Tehran to build a nuclear weapon. I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, uh, word here, Rohingya Muslims face food, medicine crisis in Myanmar camps, says the United Nations. The shortage of food, water, medical help for the already overcrowded camps in western Myanmar. As a new wave of ethnic and sectarian violence has targeted uh, the Muslims in that country. Say food prices in the area have doubled and there's not enough doctors to treat the sick and wounded. Then Su Kyi ignores the Rohingya's suffering for political gains, says analysts. A prominent political analyst says Myanmar's opposition leader uh, Su Kyi's reliance on Buddhist vote has made her silent over the ongoing rights violations against the Muslims in the Buddhist majority country. So the activist or whatever is already thinking like a politician, you know, she might become the next president of Burma, so she's not going to speak up for these Muslims because she relies on the Buddhist vote. It goes on and says, so she's willing to sacrifice these Muslims for her political ambitions, I'm afraid, and this dovetails nicely with what hap what the West wants to happen in Burma. Remember this, pro-democracy groups behind Myanmar refugee attacks. This is from Land Destroyer from the 28th of October. Supporters of this Su Kyi, leaders of the Saffron Revolution, leading ethnic cleansing of Myanmar refugees. This is a great article. Go in there and check it out. It's humongous. But it talks about the Buddhists and how there's actually, and how the Associated Press, the Western media, features grainy photos of monks outside the city hall, Myanmar, claiming that it is a rally against violence. The signs themselves tell a different tale. It says the demands of the monks include protecting the people from the dangers of Islamic extremism. It goes on here and it says that the army must shop, stop shooting the ethnic people, i.e., I guess the Buddhists. They don't want to live with extreme Bengalis anymore. And it goes on here and says drive all illegal Bengalis out of the land and all ethnic people in Myanmar should be united. 
So when they say the army must stop shooting ethnic people, what they're talking about is the army should stop firing on the vigilantes, the Buddhists, for attempting to eradicate the refugees, i.e. they're praying for genocide. Thank you.